And good morning, guys. It's an honor to be here and uh, get to bring the word today. And uh, man, I'm, I, I love being here. I get to um, hang out and teach you guys today and learn from God's word together. Uh, you know, last week, our Pastor Bill, my dad, <laughs> um, read Colossians 1, and we talked about who Jesus is, that Jesus is our rescuer, he is our redeemer, and he is the revelation of God. Like Jesus is the embodiment of the grace of God. It was an incredible message. If you, have, if you didn't get to hear it, go back and listen to it. Um, but then we have in Colossians 2, uh, you have the, the, the people of Colossians trying to become like that. How do we become like Christians? You see their efforts to be Christians. And then um, in Colossians 3, where we're going to land today, Paul gives them the answer, hey, this is what the Christian life is all about. And that's what we're going we're to talk about today. How can we live this Christian life? What is the Christian life supposed to look like? We see who Jesus is. Now, how do we live this Christian life as believers? Um, Colossians 2, we, let's just go back and go there real quick. Um, Paul actually gets on to the, the believers of, Col- of the Colossians, or Colossae, is that how you say it, or whatever? And so he's getting on to them. He says, I love what he says in verse 8, he says, Be careful that no one takes you captive through philosophy and empty deceit based on human tradition, based on the elements of the world, rather than Christ. For the entire fullness of God's nature dwells bodily in Christ, and you have been filled by him. The end of that chapter, he goes on and says, although these have a reputation for wisdom, speaking of the traditions and the ways they were trying to earn that salvation, that Christian status, by promoting self-made religion, false humility, severe treatment of the body, says they are of no value in curbing self-indulgence. So, I thought that was interesting. And then he goes, now this, in Colossians 3, is how you live the Christian life. So before getting to how do we live the Christian life, how is Paul telling us to live the Christian life, I want us to relate a little bit with the people of Colossians. How often do we think that to live the Christian life, and you could sum it up and say to be like Christ, to live the Christian life is to live like Christ, to be an example as Christ, how can we get to that? How can we become like Christ? And he gets on to the Colossians for pursuing traditions, pursuing these things that th- they thought was gonna make them holy, pursuing these things that they thought were gonna make them look good. I mean, I think of how we can relate to that is like a lot of times we think coming to church, coming, getting together with our family, coming to church, getting involved in every small group we can, um, being a, doing as many service projects as we can, serving as much as we can, doing all these things, posting a, a spiritual post on social media, right? All these things are gonna help us, make us be a better Christian. But the truth is, guys, that is not how, those are good things, But that is not how we live the Christian life. That is not gonna help us overcome temptation and live for Jesus Christ, for his glory. We do not, Christianity, becoming like Christ is not a devotion to traditions or rituals. Becoming like Christ is not a try harder, do better stupid. Becoming like Christ is seeking to the love of God, seeking to pursue and know the love of God to the point where I love him so much that I want to obey him. I can't help but to obey him. I can't help but to trust in him because I know his love. I can't help but to worship him and bring him glory. That is the Christian life. And we're gonna see it in Colossians 3 right now. If you will stand with me in the reading of God's word as we dive in. We're only doing four verses, but if you wanna continue to read the rest of the chapter, it goes on to explain what he's talking about in these four verses. Um, Let's read. Colossians 3, verse 1. So if you have been raised with Christ. So if you have been raised with Christ, seek the things 
that are above, where Christ is, at the right hand of God, seated at the right hand of God. Set your mind on things above, not on earthly things. For you died and your life is hidden with Christ in God. When Christ, who is your life, appears, then you also will appear with him in glory. Let's pray. Father, thank you for Jesus. Thank you that Jesus came and and, and is, is our life. Thank you that he has saved us and that he has redeemed us, Father. Thank you that that he is your grace. Thank you, Father, that we can pursue him and that he changes our heart. Lord, I pray that we would see you more clearly. I pray that we would, in our hearts, have a, a, a deep desire to pursue you, God, through Jesus Christ. In Jesus' name, amen. amen. The main thought today is that the Christian life is a continual pursuit, a continual pursuit of the love of God found in Christ Jesus. We have been gloriously saved by God's grace through Christ Jesus. And now the rest of our life is a continual pursuit of the love of Christ. And the truth is, this is a battle. We have been saved and that is, the victory is won, but we're still in that battle. We continually, when it says, since you've been raised with Christ, so if you've been raised with Christ, seek the things that are, that's a continual action. We have been saved, but there's a battle and we have to continually pursue the love of Christ. You know that Satan tries to rob us from pursuing the love of Christ in three, I'm gonna mention three ways today. The first way that Satan tries to rob us from pursuing the love of Christ is he tries to numb us to the mercies of God. This one is, I I personally relate with well. I was saved at an early age in life and there are many times where I can get used to God's grace. I can get used to coming to church, hearing worship songs and not being impacted by those songs and be used to God's favor and blessing and sometimes it, I'm, I'm numb to it, to be honest. And in teaching this message, I had to come before the Lord and say, God, forgive me for being numb, for not seeing the, the allness of who you are, for not realizing that without your grace in my life, who knows where I would be? Who knows how deep in sin I would be if it wasn't for my Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. Sometimes we get numb to the mercies of God. If Satan can numb you to that and say, oh man, you deserve salvation. Man, you you deserve to be saved. You're a pretty good person. If he can numb you to the mercies of God, it's gonna keep us from pursuing the love of God. So the first way that we have to combat that numbness to the mercies of God is that we have to, we have to, you pursue what you love. So we have to fight to know the love of Christ. Fight to know the love of Christ. I think it's interesting how Paul starts off. He says, so Colossians, so believers, if you've been raised with Christ, in other words, By the way, remember, you have been raised with Christ. You were dead in your trespasses and sins. You were in darkness. You were in sin and you were destined for hell. You were an enemy of God. But Jesus came and he he came to pursue you, to take your sin on the cross and die for your sins and, and take your place on the cross so that you could stand before God and worship him, so that you could have a relationship with God, so that you could now say, it is no longer I who live, but Christ who lives in me, so that you could be set free from sin and death forever, secure in your salvation. Since so, if you've been raised with Christ, seek the things that are above, where Christ is, seated at the right hand of God, victorious, right? Seated, it is finished. So we have to fight to know the love of God. Continually fight to know the love of God. I have to remind myself this often. I have to pursue the love of God continually. I've I've tried to memorize Ephesians 3 
is Paul's prayer. Paul prays, Ephesians 3, he says, I urge you, or I pray that, man, I forgot it now, but I pray that, um, that you would be rooted, can you put Ephesians 3 up there for him as well, and me? Can you put that up there? <laughs> but uh, yeah, I pray, go to the next verse. that Christ may dwell in your hearts through faith, I pray that you being firmly established in love and that Christ may dwell, may be able to comprehend with the saints what is the width and the length, the height and the depth of God's love and to know Christ's love that surpasses all understanding so that you may be filled with the fullness of God. See, a lot of times as Christians, we get caught up, man, I just gotta try harder, I gotta do better, I gotta do this, 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 and this so I can live the Christian life. But I feel like Paul's saying here is like, just pursue the love of God. Pursue to know him, to know the love of God and his grace and his mercy. And when you do that, you will naturally live for the Lord. And then I say, you see David, King David, who was a man after God's own heart, who fell into temptation. Y'all know the story, right? He ended up killing somebody, <laughs> committing adultery. And then Psalms 51, I love what he says in Psalms 51. He's like, he says, Lord, he repents. It's a long psalm of repentance, great psalm. And he says, Lord, restore unto me the joy of my salvation. Remind me your grace. Restore to me. It's almost like Satan numbed him. David got puffed up with pride, thought he was good, thought he deserved this kingship, and he thought he was good. And then all of a sudden, he's like, God, remind me of your grace. Remind me. Restore unto me the joy of my salvation. We have to fight to know the love of Christ. The second way, I feel like Satan tries to keep us from pursuing the love of God with all of our heart is he tries to, he puts distractions in our life, in this world, to rob our attention from the love of God. He wants to deceive us in thinking the things of this world are greater than the love of God. You think about the life we live in now. Think about so many things that are robbing our attention from God. What's keeping you and me from reading this right here, from pursuing the love of God. Uh, Jesus gives a parable in Matthew 4 about some of those things. He says that in Matthew 4, he's talking about the seeds and the word of God, receiving the word of God. And he has four different soils, right? or three different soils, or four, three, or whatever. He says the, the, the rich soil that receives the word of God, the rocky soil, and then he says there's that soil with the thorns. And he says the soil with the thorns that receives the word of God, but the deceitfulness of this world, the worries of this world, the worries and the deceitfulness and pleasures of this world will grow up thorns within that soil. Satan tries to fill our mind with saying, hey, the things of this world are more desirable than God's word. The things of this world are better than pursuing the love of Christ because these things are gonna satisfy your soul. But guys, the truth is, if we are caught up in pursuing the things of this world, we're, we're, gonna, we're gonna fall into temptation. If we're so caught up in, in, in pleasing others, and it's caught up in what our life looks like on social media, right? Man, I, I'm so caught up in this. Then of course we're gonna fall into peer pressure. Of course we're gonna fall into peer pressure. If my attention is on the things of this world and the pleasures of this world and pursuing those things, I'm not gonna give time to God's word. I don't have time for that. If we're so caught up with the news and worrying about everything caught up in, 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 in this world, if I'm worried about safety and all these things instead of abiding in the sovereignty and trusting in God, of course I'm gonna have anxiety in my life. We have to pursue the love of Christ because you, you not only do you pursue what you love, but also you submit to what you love. So let's delight in the word of God. Delight in the word of God. Instead of seeking the false pleasures of this world, 
Like verse 16 says in Colossians 3, it says, so I will let the word of Christ richly dwell within me. I will delight myself in the, in the word of the Lord. Like David says in Psalms 1, so happy is the man who does not walk in the ways of sinners or the wicked, nor stand in the way of sinners, nor seat in the, in the, in the place of mockers, but his delight is in the law of the Lord. And on that law, he meditates day and night. He is like a tree that is planted by streams of water whose, whose fruit bear, uh, bears fruit in season, whose leaves don't w- wither, and everything he does prospers. Because why? His delight is in the law of the Lord. He delights in the word of God. Delights in the word of God. And I love also... Uh, what Matthew six thirty three says, when worries come in life, any of you worry? Any of you like me? I've, I mean, honestly, I, I haven't really struggled with worry much, but there's so much attraction to this world and the worries of the world right now. Sometimes I'm like, man, why am I worried about this right now? I can fall into worry sometimes. But the Bible says to seek first the kingdom of God and his righteousness, for he's gonna give you everything you need. For don't worry about tomorrow. Matthew 6, 33. Now, guys, I understand that this is a lot easier said than done, right? Anybody agree? It's like, yeah, good, good word, Josh. How do we do that, right? Well, I wanna say this, that I understand. I get that. I'm preaching myself here. But you know what? Not only just me, but Paul the same way. Paul says the same thing. He's like, man, in Romans, you read Romans 7, he's like, man, the things that I wanna do, the things that I desire to do, I end up failing to. I end up falling into temptation. He's like, man, who will save me from my wicked self? Because I want to do these things, but somehow I I don't. Who will save me from this? And he says, thanks be to God that I am found in Christ Jesus, that my life is hidden in Christ Jesus, like our text says. Who Christ, who is your life, appears For you have died and your life is hidden with Christ in God. So here's the thing, guys. It's not about, oh, you're not living a good life. You are living a good life. It's continually abide in Christ. Continually pursue to know God. Continually pursue. Continually put delight in the word of God. And when I begin to delight in the word of God, above all else, above the things of this world, I naturally will begin to submit to God. But if the things of this world is keeping me from pursuing and delighting in the word of God, of course I'm gonna struggle. Of course I'm gonna fail. Of course I'm gonna fall into temptation. So I have to fight to know God's love. I have to continually delight, pursue and read the word of God. And then I will begin to glorify God in all that I do. Paul says, I haven't met, in Philippians 3 says, I haven't reached the goal yet. I haven't reached the goal yet, but one thing that I do I make every effort to take hold of it because I also have been taken hold of by Christ Jesus. Brothers and sisters, I do not consider myself to take hold of it, but one thing I do is forgetting what is behind and reaching forward to what is ahead. He's pursuing the love of God, forgetting what lies behind. I love what Hebrews 12, one and two says. It says, you have burdens in your life, you're struggling what do we do? It says, lay aside every weight and every sin. Give it to Jesus. Lay aside every weight and every sin, looking to Jesus, the founder and perfecter of our faith. For the joy that was set before him endured the cross, despising the shame, and is seated at the right hand of God. I had to run with endurance. Lay aside every weight, every sin. Give it to Jesus and pursue him. Run with endurance the race that he has set out for me. To delight 
in the word of God. And the third thing, I feel like Satan tries to keep us from pursuing the love of God. It's by causing all sorts of divisions amongst our body, amongst us believers. If he can divide us, he can keep us from pursuing the love of God. If we're so caught up with unforgiveness in our heart, if we're so caught up with not having unity in our body, if we're so caught up in, with our own preferences and our own pride and not loving one another is gonna keep us from the pursuit of knowing God's love. Now, Josh, how do you get that from this text here? <laughs> well, I think it's, it's right here in the last verse. It says, so... When Christ appears, when Christ, who is your life appears, then you also will appear with him in glory. You praise what you love, so participate in spiritual worship. What is worship? A lot of times we get caught up thinking that worship is singing songs. It's a way, a form of worship to express praise to God but worship is describing worth to. Worship is praising, describing worth to, glorifying our God or something. I love how Paul describes spiritual worship. Paul in, in, in Romans, or no, yeah, Romans 12, one and two, he says, I urge you to present your bodies as a living sacrifice, holy and pleasing to God. For this is true worship. Worship. And in Colossians 3, 12, it says, but Christ is all and in all. Christ is all and in all. Present your, your bodies as a living sacrifice, which is your true worship. Guys, true spiritual worship is not just me being able to raise my hand on a Sunday morning. It's the love I have for my brothers and sisters in Christ. That is, our true, that is our true spiritual worship. How often do we come into the church and we have unforgiveness in our heart towards others? We have bitterness in our heart, but, but Paul says, bear with one another. Bear with one another. In other words, love one another, even though you have your differences. Choose to love one another as Christ loved me. Satan wants to divide us as the body of Christ I mean, think about it. How many people do you know that don't come to church because, oh, there's just hypocrites there or I'm just not welcome there? And I'm thankful that we are at a part of church that, man, most of our people are loving and welcoming and we have great unity at North Park, which is a blessing. But we have to fight to keep that. We have to love one another. We have to have, un we have, to have forgiveness in our heart. We have to be quick to forgive because if we're divided, it's gonna keep us from worshiping our God. John, in John, Jesus says, by this, or John says this, by this, everyone will know that you are my disciples by your love for one another. By your love for one another. People will know that you're a believer. People will know that you're living the Christian life. How you love one another. And then this is really interesting is the greatest commandment, right? Somebody comes up to Jesus and says, hey, what's the greatest of all these commandments? What is the greatest commandment? And what does Jesus say? He says, well, the first is love the Lord your God with all your heart, with all your soul, with all your might. And then he says, and we forget this one. We know that one. Then he says, and the second one is like this. It's always interesting that he says that, that the second one is like this. It's like the first. In other words, this has to do with worship. Love the Lord your God with all your heart, mind, soul, and strength. That is worship, right? Your spiritual life, it is true worship to love the Lord your God with all your heart, mind, soul, and strength. And the second one is like this, to love your neighbor 
as yourself. Love your neighbor as yourself. You praise what you love, so let's participate in spiritual worship. I truly believe this is how we live the Christian life. To pursue the love of Christ. But there are so many things that are getting in that way of pursuing the love of Christ. And if you're like me, you realize like, man, I love Christ, I wanna pursue him, but so often I fall short. And what is that? And we try to say, we beat ourselves up, man, I just gotta do better. I gotta try harder. I think the answer is what Paul is saying is pursue to know the love of Christ. If I knew the love of Christ for me, if I knew how much he loved me and if I fully wrapped my head around that and took delight in his word and, 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 and found good community and love for my brothers and sisters in Christ, then I would not fall into sin. And I think this is a continual lifestyle that we have to, continual thing that we have to do is continually pursue the love of Christ. As the band comes up, I wanna close with two ways. Number one, what is keeping you from pursuing the love of Christ? Is it your phone? This has a lot of distractions on it, right? This feeds your pleasures, this feeds your worries, this feeds your, your wealth, your attractions. Is it status? Or is it simply just being numb to God's mercy? Is it division? Do you have unforgiveness in your heart towards somebody? in the church or as a brother and sister in Christ? What's keeping you from pursuing the love of God? Maybe you need to fast something. Say, God, I'm giving this up because I wanna pursue the love of God. Maybe it's social media. Maybe it's your phone all in general. <laughs> Maybe it's who knows. Maybe you just need to simply pray, God, Restore the joy of your salvation to me. God, I have not been in all of your glory, in all of your love. I need you to do a work in my heart. What is it? What is keeping you from pursuing the love of God? And secondly, you may be in the room and you may be an unbeliever. You may be an unbeliever and you're like, man, I, I haven't been pursuing the love of God because I haven't surrendered to him. Can I tell you something? God is pursuing you. God loves you and he wants a relationship with you. What is keeping you from surrendering to his pursuit of you? Because if you surrender your heart to him, God, he, he, will, he will save your soul. He will free you from sin and death. He will change your heart. I want to end with the, with the hymn, and you can sing along with me because I'm a terrible singer. This is out of my comfort zone. <laughs> but uh, what's that song? It goes, turn your eyes upon Jesus. Turn your eyes upon Jesus. Look full in his wonderful face. For the things of earth will grow strangely dim in the light of his warrior's grace. It's my prayer for you today. As you turn your eyes upon Jesus, pursue the love of Christ. Let's pray. Father, I thank you for Jesus. I thank you that he is the full embodiment of your grace, Lord. I thank you that it's all about Jesus. I thank you that it's only Jesus who could give me a life, that Christ is my life, Father. 
Oh Lord, I pray that you would break any numbness in our hearts, that we'd be overwhelmed by your glory and your wonder. I pray that we would not pursue the things of this world, but we would see you so desirable that we would pursue you with all our heart, God. That we would delight in your word that you've given us. And Lord, I pray that you would break any divisions among your people. That anyone in this room that has unforgiveness in their heart towards a believer would seek that forgiveness. That we would be a church that loves each other so much. That shows our true worship to you. That we would worship genuinely, passionately, by the way that we love one another and encourage each other in the pursuit of you. In Jesus' name, amen.